Hi, this is Knowledge Quest 7. We are moving right along to bearings. So where should you focus here? Uh, the different types of bearings and their uses and distinguishing features. So really just understanding the lingo. So nomenclature of a typical bearing, um, special attention to the difference between bearing life, rating life, and catalog load rating. These are all different terms, but we're going to be using them a lot. Basic considerations when selecting a bearing, um, what to do when the bearing manufacturer's test conditions don't match up with what you're designing for or your application. Also, you should be reading along in your textbook as you complete this KQ. I think it's going to help clarify the key points on the slides. All right, so just top level about bearings. There's another association. Remember, we had AGMA for gears. Now we have ABMA, American Bearing Manufacturers Association. And they do all the testing and information gathering and distribution about bearings. So bearings are highly engineered, precision-made components that enable machinery to move at extremely high speeds and carry large loads while minimizing noise and vibration. They are found everywhere. Applications ranging from automobiles, airplanes, computers, construction equipment, machine tools, DVD players, although I haven't seen one of those in a while, refrigerators and ceiling fans. Um, if something twists, turns, or moves, it probably has a bearing in it. I'm going to play this video for you within the Knowledge Quest. We'll watch about the first 12 minutes and then I'll skip to some information at the end. <laughs> So normally I don't use hammers on bearings, but what I wanted to do today was do a video on bearings used in manual transmissions and probably transmissions in general. You see, there's a lot of hype on the internet, a lot of misinformation, so I wanted to clear some things up. So in the little opening there, I showed you actually how a typical ball bearing gets disassembled or assembled, if you want to think of it in backwards terms, how we go back together again. I think if I give you an explanation of how these bearings actually work, some of the hype on the internet and the misinformation, you'll understand better, and you'll be able to figure out for yourself what is actually good information and bad information. Let's get to it. So that bearing I just took apart is a typical open style ball bearing. It's called a deep groove ball bearing or a Conrad style bearing. I don't know where the name Conrad comes from. I think it probably has something to do with concentric and radial type of bearings. But these are called deep groove bearings. And the deep groove means that this groove inside here is deep. And the ball fits in the groove like this. This is your inner ring or inner race. And this is your outer ring or outer race. What I try to explain to people is that loads on bearings, you have what's called a radial load which is based on the radius of the bearing. Or think of it up and down this way in terms of gear trains, load that's going to try to push the bearing this way. And you have axial loads going through the center axis of the bearing. And that's like a thrust load. It's going to push the bearing and try to push the bearing this way. So you have also a thing in some bearing catalogs called dynamic load, which is some equation of both radial and axial loads put together. You have a typical open style bearing you have what's called a shielded style bearing. If you notice, these are metal shields on the bearing. Sometimes they could be single shields on one side, and it could be open on another side, or it can be double shielded. The shield helps keep dirt and debris out of the bearing, but still allows oil to flow through the bearing. A lot of times in manual transmissions, it's good to use shielded bearings because it cuts down in windage in the transmission and keeps dirt from getting into the bearing. And remember, in the manual transmission, there is no filter. Uh, the latest transmissions seem to come with seals in them now. Seals work really well. I find that with sealed bearings, there's absolutely zero bearing failures. Again, most bearing failures are from dirt and debris and not overload at this point. Bearings are pretty well designed. So let's get back to 
this particular bearing here. This is a standard, what we call a 307 bearing. There's 307 bearings and all different shapes and sizes. And I wanted to show people some differences of the same bearing, and there was the same variation of the bearing. And so you get a better understanding. First of all, in the Muncie four speed application for Muncie transmissions, Originally, the Muncie transmission, when it came out in 1963, used what's called a 207 style bearing. And noticed how thin it is. And they had problems with this tiny bearing failing. So they were able to fit a bigger diameter bearing in the case, but they couldn't go wider. So what they did was, in other words, they wanted to have a bearing diameter of this style, which is called a 307 bearing, but the same width of the 207 bearing. You can see the difference in the width. So thus they came out with a narrow 307 bearing. So this bearing here, it's got the same outside diameter, same inside diameter, but it's narrow, okay? It's also important to notice something about bearings that a lot of people don't pick up is the chamfer of the inner ring right over here. You can see that there's a chamfer to it, all right? compared to some bearings that have no chamfer at all. Kind of, we call this a square in a ring. And sometimes that's very crucial in how a bearing actually fits on a shaft, what's going to thrust against it, the snap ring, for example, is it going to have enough support, and so forth. So a lot of times, when you're using a bearing that has a chamfer and you have to put a snap ring on it, they may have a washer that goes over it so the snap ring has a nice full contact to ride against in the bearing. So that's very important. Using the wrong bearing with the wrong type of chamfer can lead to snap rings blowing off and a failure. Now, another misconception is, is that this bearing is going to be weaker than this bearing because this bearing is wider. The fact of the matter is, is the raceways are the same, and I'll show you. We're going to take a bearing that we took apart, and we're going to take a bearing in a ring from a narrow setup. And you could see that the raceways are the same, exactly the same. Support is the same, there's no difference. So the balls are the same diameter, the raceways are the same diameter, the raceways are the same radius, everything is the same. So a narrow 307 bearing is not any weaker than a regular standard 307 bearing. So there's people that are buying kits to put big 307 bearings and early Muncie's are wasting their money. Another thing people overlook is snap ring groove location. Here we have a 307 bearing. Notice it's got a square in a ring. This is actually for a Chrysler three-speed application. But notice the snap ring groove, it's hard to see in this black one, is much bigger than this one. So again, it looks like the same bearing, but if you look carefully, this snap ring groove is much smaller than this snap ring groove which will place the bearing in a different location or actually make the bearing move if you were using it in this application. So when looking at bearings again, here we have a bearing that's got a square in a ring. This has got a radius to it, and they're not the same. They're not for the same application. Even though they have the same amount of balls and the same amount of uh, diameters in both the outside and the inside, they're not really identical bearings. So another thing you always hear about is maximum capacity bearings, bearings that have more balls in them compared to, say, regular Conrad-style bearings. Okay. Now, if we're looking into loads, okay, obviously this bearing is going to be able to take more of a load or a radial load up and down than this bearing will because it has more balls in it. The balls are the same diameter, same radius of the raceways. Everything's the same except this one has more balls, except that this bearing has slots to put the balls in. Some people call these filling slot bearings. So if I line these slots up like that, you could see where they would place the ball in there. Normally the bearing would go together like the regular bearings do, where you put the race offset, put maybe eight balls in, and then put the rest of the balls in through the slots. Here's the problem. When it comes to axial loads, depending on the direction, axial loads go down to nothing. So these bearings are good for radial loads, but for thrust load applications, they can fail and have less of a rating than these. The problem with dynamic load ratings in catalogs is that the fact is multiply this by a certain application so much for radial that it gets the dynamic load way up. So in this application where you have spur type gears, using a max capacity bearing is great 
because for the most part, this gear set is only going to produce a radial load up and down. The gears are going to try to pull themselves apart. So a max capacity bearing like this is really good. But now suppose we're using a gear that's helical like this one. Now what we've introduced is a radial load as well as an axial load. So the big misconception that you see is that using one of these bearings is going to be okay. When in fact it's not because the axial load produced by this gear set will work against these filling slots and blow the bearing apart eventually. You can see here that the filling slot of the bearing actually cuts into the inner race weight. And what that does is that reduces the thrust capacity of the bearing. If the ball actually pushes against that area, there's going to be no thrust load and the bearing is going to blow apart or damage. Same thing for the outer race. You'll see that the filling slot as well cuts into the raceway. Another thing is the cages. Because obviously you have more balls, you're going to have more heat generated with these bearings. Therefore, in race applications, they can generate quite a bit more heat than a standard open type bearing. The cages will generate more friction because they have these kind of separators in them. Balls go against these separators and generate more heat. I've seen a lot of this happen where the cage actually heats up and actually drops down on the inner ring, scuffs against it, and puts more metal into the bearing. The bearing wears rapidly. So we have a lot of people selling these. They're a lot more money than standard bearings, but they really do not work properly. You're better off using a simple bearing like this with shields or seals on it. Matter of fact, GM has been doing this for years. They ditched this program because they found out that these bearings actually wore rapidly, caused a lot of warranty issues compared to these. That simple. Ball bearings come in a variety of sizes. This is for a Mitsubishi transmission, Chrysler, probably for some sort of like Sebring or something like that. I don't know. And they have different size numbers on them. These are not standard sizes. This is by NSK. It says here B25-139. These are special bearings for manual transmissions. This bearing is another type of bearing that was used in a lot of Japanese transmissions where they have these kind of series of the 63-32 style bearings. They're very similar looking, but they have very oddball sizes and very oddball metric sizing, usually specific for manual transmissions. Now here we have a clutch bearing. This is something different. So let's get into clutch bearings and let me show you how these clutch bearings actually work. So clutch release bearings simply are a bearing that needs to be used primarily for axial loads going this way. It's gonna be pushing against the clutch pressing the fingers in. So the load is strictly on the face of the bearing. Now there's all sorts of different bearing faces designed and built around simply a thrust bearing type of application where you're going to have a thrust bearing with a, two outside races and they're going to be housed in some fancy arrangement. You can actually see in here, you can actually see the thrust bearing and the different races on the outside just that it's housed specially for an application and much beefier because these have to ride against the clutch fingers so this has to be hardened and special and all of that but in general that's what a release bearing how it works next up is tapered cups and cones this is a front bearing for a T5 transmission and this here is also a bearing for a T5 transmission and it's actually also used as a pinion bearing in many 12 volt Chevy rear ends and you can see that there's a difference in sizes, okay? Surprisingly, this particular setup, this is called your cone, this is called your race, so, or cup. So, cone bearing, cup and cone bearing, all right? And they go together like this. Cup and cone bearings or tapered bearings can have an incredible amount of axial load capacity this way because they have a taper to them. The drawback to these is that you're gonna have to have shims and you're gonna have to have some sort of preload to keep them together like when you do wheel bearings in a car or pinion bearings again in the rear axle. The different types of angles of these bearings, you can see that this one has more of a severe angle on the right here compared to the one on the left, will produce a higher axial load capacity. So they make them all different sizes and shapes and they work pretty much the same way. Again, what's good about these types of bearings is that this particular bearing can have a very small form factor and actually sometimes be equivalent in load rating to a bearing this size, providing, of course, you have to build into the design the ability to have it shimmed so that you can keep these two pieces together. The disadvantage of these bearings is that any slight movement, in other words, if this thing were ever to come apart, it falls off very quickly. So you lose clearances. They develop 
larger quite rapidly if you have any type of end play that exceeds your specification of the transmission. If you've got a 3,000 end play and you go to 5,000 end play, this thing could drop off way down and you can blow your gears up. So critical setup on taper bearings is very important. You can see the race is destroyed. You can see all these pits that it's been spalling. And if you take notice of how this race is worn, you can actually see that this side is worn more than the other side. So you can actually see where the thrust load is on this race. You can see it's pretty much hammered on this side, right? Look at that. You can see that it's hammered on this side, yet this side is clean. Look at that. So you could see that this particular bearing was subject to a thrust load or an axial load, and that's what really took this bearing out. And more than that, you could see the direction that it was going, and it obviously it was going towards this side more than this side because you can see how this area, again, is super clean on this edge compared to this area, which is all peened over and destroyed. Okay, I like that video because it gives really close up high resolution uh, pictures of bearings. So questions from this video will relate to radial versus thrust loads, how bearing features affect the performance of a bearing and how bearings often fail. Okay, so next there are many distinct bearing types, each with a particular characteristic or characteristics which are suited to specific applications. So chapter 11.1 gives some good information about the different bearing types, as well as this page hyperlinked from ABMA. Um, so visit those two resources to read about the four most common types of bearings. So in the quiz, you'll just be asked to identify each of the common bearings and describe their distinguishing features and possibly identify where um, each of the, these bearings could be used. So some terminology, uh, you will hear rolling contact bearing, anti-friction bearing, and rolling bearing are just all terms used to describe bearings where the main load is transferred through elements in rolling contact versus sliding contact. So we're not going to look at hydrodynamic bearings in this class. We're just going to look at rolling element bearings in this class. Bearings are made to take pure radial loads. So as the video is talking about these up and down, pure thrust loads, which would be axially along the shaft, or a combination of both. Usually the inner ring is the rotating part, but sometimes it's the outer ring that rotates and the inner ring is held stationary. So just, um, you don't need to memorize everything, but just generally, just good, you know, terms to know as a mechanical engineer, identify the outer ring, the inner ring, the balls, also called the rolling elements, because we're gonna talk about cylindrical roller bearings where the rolling elements aren't spherical, they're cylindrical. So rolling elements and then the separator or retainer that kind of holds all the rolling elements in place. Okay, so to the analysis part. Bearing life, um, it's gonna take a minute to get used to the terminology, I'm just giving you a heads up now. So read chapter 11, 12 and answer the following questions. These will all be on the quiz. What type of stress occurs in bearings? In ideal working envir environments, bearing failure will occur due to metal fatigue. So what do you think makes the ideal environment for a bearing? Um, and then as engineers and designers, we need a quantitative life measure to estimate how long a bearing will last. So that's what we call bearing life. So bearing life refers to two things, either the number of revolutions of the inner ring until the first evidence of fatigue, or the number of hours of use at a standard angular speed until first evidence of fatigue. If you think about it, these are both just number of revolutions. Uh, read a little bit in the text to learn how is the first evidence of fatigue defined because once a uh, bearing has gone past its life, there's some evidence of fatigue, but the bearing is still usable. Other questions, what does the industry term rating life mean? So this is different than bearing life. Um, what other terms are synonymous with rating life? Who determines bearing life? How is it determined? And what's the most commonly used agreed upon rating life? Bearing load life at rated reliability. Read chapter 11.3 carefully and answer the following. What is the catalog load rating? This is a different term. 
Um, and then why is the catalog rating to be used as a reference value, not an actual load you would expect a bearing to support? And the textbook will, will detail this answer for you. So how do you select a bearing? To select a bearing for a given application, you relate your desired load and life requirements. So your desired load is your FD, your life requirements, your life desired, what you want the bearing to achieve, to the published catalog rating life. So R is for rated, D is for desired. You can think of R as like what's in a catalog, D is what you're trying to achieve. That's your real life situation. And then note, this is a little bit confusing. This term FR, this rated force, is just another term for the catalog load rating. Again, lots of terminology. You're going to have to spend some time with this. Um, often you'll want to express the life in hours at a given speed. In this case, any life L, so capital L in revolutions, can be expressed as 60 times this cursive L, which is the speed times. Or, pardon, the cursive L is the hours, and then the, the italicized N is the given speed, just as it was for gears. So we can combine um, equations 11, 2, A, and B to get a useful expression for catalog load rating. So here it is. We'll be using this. You'll see it in my analysis tool. And then lastly, you'll see that it's often useful to define a dimensionless multiple of rating life, which is just simply your desired life over the rated life. For the quiz, you're going to do this first concept check, determine catalog rating. So you have a typical bearing manufacturer that rates its bearings for 1 million revolutions. I'm going to pause here and say that one company that rates its bearings for 1 million revolutions is SKF. A different company called the Timken Bearing Company rates its bearing for 90 million revolutions. So they're different rating systems. Kind of fun fact, Grace Timken is a Cal Poly alum. She graduated last year and her family is the Timken Bearing Manufacturer. So it was kind of neat to have her in class and figure that out. So let's say you need a ball bearing for an application that requires 6,000 hours at 1,700 RPM with a load of 350 pounds and a reliability of 90%. Which catalog rating would you use to begin searching for a bearing? I highly suggest that you work through example 11.1 first. Assume ball bearings. And you can use this example to calibrate your analysis tool and then do the concept check with your tool. Next question that will be on the quiz, how would your answer change if you were searching for a bearing from a manufacturer, say Timken, who rates its bearings for 90 million revolutions? I'm just gonna stop and show you what my analysis tool looks like for this first problem. So here's my analysis tool for bearings. The first equation you'll wanna put in is 11.3. This is catalog load rating for 90% reliability. So we'll just make up some numbers. Let's say we have a situation where we need um, to support 500 pounds. This would be in the radial direction only. We'll get to when we have, it's gonna be the next knowledge quest, combined radial and thrust loading. But now 500 pounds in the radial direction, and that would be, we would do a shear and bending moment diagram just like we did in um, our previous lab to figure out the, you know, the radial load at the bearing. Let's say we need this to be in service for 10 kilo hours at 800 RPM. This A, so it is three if you have a ball bearing and 10 over three or 3.3333 for cylindrical roller bearings. So you have to put that in your analysis tool. Let's say we have a ball bearing. Let's say it's an SKF ball bearing. So our rated life in revolutions is 1 million. Our catalog load rating in pounds is 3,915, but you'll notice that um, in Shigui, the, the bearing manufacturing information that is provided, the C10 is in kilonewtons. So make sure you have a little conversion from pounds to kilonewtons. So 17.4, that's what we would enter into a bearing catalog with to begin what I call bearing shopping. And then how would your answer change if you were searching for a bearing from a manufacturer? I need to put some more fancy things in here. I'm just gonna type in 90 million. Okay, so that makes sense. If a bearing is already rated for 90 million cycles, its catalog load rating is going to be less. 
Here's where it gets a little interesting, relating load, life, and reliability. So a common problem you might face is, is, as a designer is the fact that test conditions for which bearings are rated are not the working conditions. You might have situations where, for example, the desired load is not the manufacturer's test load, or the desired speed is different from the test speed. You can imagine how common this would be. The reliability expectation is different, likely higher than 90%, and your job is to convert bearing parameters from manufacturer specs to your design requirements. And this shows up all the time in design. One example that I can think of is um, PV solar panels. So they're tested at 25 degrees Celsius with um, like a perfectly sunny day where the solar radiance is um, a certain value. But then if you were a PV installer or a designer, you would have to you know, account for the fact that you might be in a slightly cloudier location and your temperature might fluctuate. So this is, um, this is just a common situation in any type of engineering or design. So how do we take care of it in bearings? We do it with this kind of funky equation that I'll talk you through. So the following equation may be used to convert from a design situation with a desired load, desired life, and reliability to a catalog load rating based on a rating life at 90% reliability. X naught and theta minus X naught and B are the Weibel parameters and are often provided in bearing manufacturers catalog. So we're not going to get too crazy with this, but um, Weibull is just a different type of distribution. So most of you have learned about the normal distribution or the bell-shaped curve. And for a bell-shaped curve, there are two parameters that are used to define that curve. It is the mean and the standard deviation. So the mean tells you, you know, where the peak of your curve is. Sorry, I should be drawing this out. Um, and then the standard deviation defines how wide your curve spreads out. So Weibull parameters are kind of like that. They're just for a different distribution. AF is an application factor, kind of talked about before, meant to take into account overload, dynamic loading, and any uncertainty. And this is also tabulated values or values that you would know from experience in a particular application. Concept check. Let's use this new formula with the Weibull parameters. This is going to take you a minute to program into your tool. So I'm assuming you're going to stop this video, work on your tool, and come back, etc. The design load on a deep groove ball bearing is 450 pounds, and an application factor of 1.3 is appropriate. The speed of the shaft is 300 RPM. The life is 25 kilohours, or 25,000 hours, with a reliability of 99%. What is the C10, the catalog load rating you should use to begin searching for a bearing from a manufacturer like SKF, whose rating life is 10 to the sixth revolutions or 1 million? So the first thing you're gonna need for your tool are these Weibull parameters. These are hidden in the, um, the problem set for this chapter. So I don't know why they're not in the main chapter, but the, here they are, I've just typed them myself. So you can copy paste this into your analysis tool, make sure these parameters are in there. All right, so here's my analysis tool for equation 1110 that we just talked about. I changed the numbers, but let's say uh, in this case, we had an application factor of 1.2, a desired load of 400 pounds, 8,000 hours desired, 7,000 RPM is our speed desired, our desired reliability is 0.95, uh, our rated life is 1 million. XD, the dimensionless multiple of rating life, is calculated automatically. It is needed for equation 1110, but it is easily calculated from other inputs. I wouldn't have that as a second input. Three for ball bearings and 10 over three for roller bearings. Maybe I'll get fancy this quarter and put a drop down ball or roller bearings. And then these Weibull parameters. So notice when I apply 90 million, the parameters automatically change. In this case, we would need a bearing with a catalog load rating of 37.73 kilonewtons. So this brings up a good question. Um, let's just go find a bearing, 37.73. This is table 11.2. We have a deep groove ball bearing. What did we say for a deep groove? We needed to find 37.73. We have to choose a bearing that is rated a little bit above that. So we wouldn't want to choose um, 
an 0 to 50 millimeter bearing. So this is how they're going to be specified. So 0 to, so the series, and then the bore. We would want to go with an 0 to 55 because see how the C10 is 43.6. So here, um, table 11.2, there's only one series. But with the cylindrical roller bearings, there's O2 series and O3 series, and these series are specifying the width of the bearing. In this um, Knowledge Quest, we're only looking at radial loads. Knowledge Quest 8, we are going to be um, looking at what happens when you have combined radial and thrust loading, for example, loading um, from a helical gear. So this would be our nice, easy spur gear case. Um, also, one more thing I want to point out that's kind of strange. So if you, let's change, let's change the inputs to equation 11.3 and 11.10 to be the same. So 500, 10,000, speed 800. I'm going to change this to be 90% as um, is the case up here. So everything's the same, look, 500, 10,000, 800, we have a, a ball bearing, 90% reliability. Equation 11.3 is going to give you a slightly different C10 than equation 11.10, but it's minimal. So when we're grading these, you know, we're, we're not gonna be grading your exact C10, we're going to be looking at what bearing did you select based on the C10 that your analysis tool spit out. So if you wanted to skip equation 11.3 and just program in equation 11.10, that would be fine. But 11.3 um, just kind of helps you understand what's going on, I think, before you jump to the, the Weibull stuff. Oh, here's a little goal seat question for you. Let's say that in this concept check, you choose a bearing with a C10 of 30 kilonewtons for this application. What would your reliability be in this case? So you are going to do some goal seeking. So I'll show you my tool. Let's, so our numbers are different. Let's say that we, we have 90% reliability. Um, let's say we have, we choose a bearing. Well, let's just pick a real bearing. So 17.65 is our C10. Let's say we go with an O230. That C10 is 19.5. If we were to like purchase this bearing and use it in this application, how would that change our reliability? So 19.5, that's our C10, our actual C10 from the bearing that we chose. How would this change the reliability? So, you know, I love a good goal seek. What if analysis, goal seek. So we're going to set cell, this one, to 19.5 by changing cell reliability. That makes sense, right? We're using a, a slightly stronger, stronger, may not be the best word, but um, a bearing that's able to hold a higher radial load. Um, so our reliability is going to be increased. Okay, so that's how you tackle that part of the um, concept check. So another question that might come up is, What's a good bearing life recommendation? How do you know what your, you know, your desired life in hours or kilo hours should be? If you're going to be running something a lot, let's start at the end of this list or the bottom of this list. Machines for continuous 24-hour service where reliability is of extreme importance. You want your desired life to be pretty high because it's not going to take too much time in service um, to get up to the, you know, the, the rated life in revolutions. Um, down at the bottom of the list, instruments and apparatus for infrequent use. So it makes sense that we would um, have a, a smaller desired life. Here is the table 11.5 for load application factors. So you can see that your load application factor is going to change with the type of application. So if you have an application with precision gearing, that means that you're going to have less variability in the loads that are transferred from the gears through the shaft to the bearings. You essentially can end up choosing a bearing with a smaller C10. 
commercial gearing, you might have some misalignment, you are probably using a quality gear index that is, is less than a precision application. So the load factor is going to um, be there to make sure that you choose a bearing with a C10 that's a little bit bigger. And then it kind of just goes up from there. So machinery with no impact, light impact, moderate impact, you're accounting for that variability in your loads, which needs to be taken up by the bearings with this load factor. So I think that's it. Um, I think the bearing stuff is really fun. I think because, you know, we get to go in and choose an actual bearing, see the C10 that works. Um, what we'll do is, start to go back to our, our shaft design and the power transmission case study and look um, to see that the diameter that we specified is going to be compatible with the bearing that we chose. And if not, uh, what, are, what are the things that we would do in that case? Would we machine down the shaft? Would we add a bushing? So uh, I like when we get to this point in the class where we have covered gears and shafts and bearings because all of those three components or sets of components work together. So it's, um, it's more interesting when we, we know a little bit about all of them. Okay, that's it. See you soon.